see, but it, it'll be fine. Um, I guess let's start. Um, you want to start? I mean, I, I guess the first question is, like, you were game director on God of War. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what that role involved and kind of, you know, your approach to that? Yeah. A game director, awesome. Thank you. Uh, in my mind, is somebody who makes everybody on the team miserable <laughs> for the duration of the project. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a, honestly, a majority of this job is about putting yourself in uncomfortable positions every single day. Uh, it's about not knowing at all what you want to do, uh, but also knowing exactly what you want, right? You have to have this straddling balance of, of realizing that games are incredibly complex and that you can have an idea of where you want to go with something, the structure of something, uh, but the actual sort of moment to moment figuring all this out, it unravels over the course of, in God of War's case, like five years. Wow. Yeah, so you're talking to people and getting them excited. So you're, you're sort of selling everybody a car for like two years because there's really not much there and you're just convincing them, hey, you should try this. This is going to be great. Trust me. Uh, even when it's a crazy idea or it's something that is way too big, uh, initially, the first year of the game, I kept telling everybody the game was only going to be 10 hours. I was like, yeah, don't worry, it's going to be small, it'll be 10 hours, it'll be fine. Uh, and then I grow it to like, oh, well, it's 10 hours in, in the critical path, and then 10 hours in the exploration. So, yeah, it's 20 hours, but don't worry, it won't get any bigger than that. And then it was later, okay, it's going to be about 40 hours. Uh, and, and to be honest, everybody's always surprised when the game's finished. We're like, we were really surprised at how long it was. I don't think I've ever worked on anything that wasn't way bigger than we expected. Uh, and that's like all the way back working on fighting games at, at Paradox. Uh, everything seems to balloon when more and more people get involved. And I think from, from my perspective, the director is just somebody there constantly keeping an eye on everything, overlooking the entirety of the project. And at Santa Monica, we do it slightly differently than other studios. Yeah. So I'm working with the, the marketing groups to kind of make sure that the game's message is consistent throughout and actually looking with the licensing groups to ensure that the, the, there's consistency. So there's like sort of one view over the entire thing. Uh, but I really don't produce anything during the day except hot air. Right. It's crazy. Like, all I do is talk. I used to uh, animate. So I started animation, and you'd end every day with at least, like, one substantive contribution. Like, oh, look at this. I created an animation, and, and it's awesome. Uh, and sometimes I'd create three or four in a day, and I'd feel really productive. And now all I do is go to meetings all day and, and beg, mostly, of like, please, just do this. Trust me on this. Uh, yeah, a lot of, of meetings. I get that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I imagine it's the same thing. Like, when yeah. you're actually just constantly trying to convince people that, no, 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 it's just a little bit further. It's like when you're, you're low on gas and you're like, let's pull over and ask for directions. No, 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 it's just up ahead. I feel like that's all I'm doing. It's just up ahead. Don't worry. I mean, you, you mentioned a, a minute ago that 30 to 40 hours of gameplay length. I mean, so Blood and Truth was five to six hours, and, and like even that was challenging to review. How the hell do you approach a 30 to 40 hour game and just constantly reviewing it during development? It's very challenging, especially when the game isn't actually put together until usually that lasts like six to eight months. Yeah, yeah, so a yeah. lot of the times you can't even see the entirety of the experience. So you know what the whole experience needs to be, but it's all in broken pieces all over the place. And I think it was uh, the Christmas before our release in April where we actually had everything fully assembled all together and people could take the game home uh, and then come back and say what they thought. And, and that... It's weird because it felt like every God of War game I've ever made, Christmas was the time that everybody would take the build home and then come back right before release and either say really good things or just have a lot of very, very bad things to say. Uh, and this was a nice mixture of there was a lot of bad things because we had really terrible balance and we had just gotten the economy online for all the upgrading, so it was a disaster. Uh, but that was the first pass. That's how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be terrible. Uh, but then a lot of other stuff like the, the camera, Right, the no camera uh, cut thing that we were trying out was something that a lot of people didn't believe throughout the duration of the project. They were basically saying, this is a lot of work. And it really was, like, to be totally uh, respect to the team. I put a lot of work on that animation and cinematics group, even though in the beginning I was like, ah, don't worry, it's going to be fine. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, and, and it was really a big deal. The AI group, the animation group, everybody had to do all this extra work to figure out how to get everything to work. 
We had to invent new rules, new ways to set up cinematics, new ways for characters to sort of navigate the world and hit their marks. Um, but it paid off. Like at the end, these people are coming back after Christmas and saying, okay, now I get it. Playing the entire game, I get why it was important that we did this, because it just felt differently. But actually attacking something like that and, and, and testing it, like I, I mean, I struggled, because I would, I was at the end trying to get people to say, I, I can't go to meetings right now, I just need to play the game. But you'd get maybe three hours before yeah. somebody would be like, all right, there's a fire. And there is a fire every five minutes on one of these projects. It's ridiculous. It's even more challenging in VR, because at least when you're playing the game, you can still see in the peripheral vision completely coming over to ask you a question. Yeah. When you're in VR, you're, you're, you're trapped. Oh, so you get until that, somebody gets you. Tap. Yeah. <laughs> They're perfectly yeah. timed. Yeah. That, Very like, much so. You guys, when, when you do character interactions within VR, like part of the magic of that is to feel like the person is looking directly at you. Yeah. That's not on the performance, is it? Like you're actually yeah. doing some extra stuff. So what do, you, what do you do to get that to work? I think we found, so, you know, I mean, VR is such an, a new medium. I think one of the things, one of the biggest learnings that we've found is like, there's a design language that we have an industry have kind of created over the, the last few decades, you know, thinking about, you know, health systems, locomotion systems, cutscenes, cutaways, uh, even, you know, like PC control systems like WASD kind of like iterated over a very long time. Yeah. And some of those things work brilliantly in VR, and some of those things just do not work at all in VR. So for us, it was it was really exciting time to try and play around with that. And, and one of it was within our, our, our drama and our, and our kind of our story elements, where you know the player is the camera, so you you have no control over where the player is looking. You know, you have a scene with seven or eight characters. And actually, the player could just spend the entire time just fixating on one character. So when you're directing it... I kept trying to, to look under the table when the guy <laughs> was talking to me. There's, bizarrely enough, there is a, some chewing gum hidden under a table yeah. I found the other day. And it was like, OK, that's why the game took long. There, yeah. there a lot of attention to detail there. But um, we had to uh, create some eye and, and head tracking tech so that when you're moving back and forth like this, that the character's eyes keep following you and their head subtly moves. Because as soon as we didn't have that enabled, as soon as you start moving around, you just feel the character is talking through you rather than at you, and it's super important. Left, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So you, you know, the, that kind of personal interaction, you've got to have like someone just looking at you and paying attention to you. So it was tech like that, which I think you know, only need to do in VR, but it was super complex to get right. Yeah. yeah. Did that come on early or late? Uh, it, we it came together quite hot at the end. I think the whole you know games can come together right. quite hot, right? So yeah. uh, there's definitely elements where you think this is going to work really well, and then you start trying to implement it, and it doesn't work well, and you think I've got to keep the faith, got to keep with it, and then you try it, you know, over weeks and months more, and you're doing user testing, and it's still coming back, and you're like, oh man, we've got to crack this. It's so important. Like our inventory system, you know, we had, um, you know, you you wear a headset, the the PlayStation can track the headset, the PlayStation can track your left and right move, but it has no concept of where the rest of your body is. Uh, and you know, we started to have ammo patches here and am ammo clips here and, and holsters down here. And uh, it, it worked most of the time, but if you start leaning forward and reaching down, it's like, what is the player going for? Yeah. So yeah, it, it was, gets very confused. Yeah, yeah. I, I found as I was moving around, I was like, wait a minute, something's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because what you said, like all games, and I, I mean, maybe there are people out there who, who do not adhere to this, but every game I've ever worked on and every game I've ever talked about to people is ugly as hell until it's not ugly, which is usually in the last like six to eight months yeah. of, of the game. It's usually a disaster. It's all in pieces everywhere, and it is constantly about keeping the faith. Yeah. And that's very hard. Like when you start getting teams that range from anywhere of 20 to like 300 people, you have 300 individual human beings with different levels of stress and anxiety that are saying, I am not confident in this. And that kind of permeates out to the people near them. And 
You're just constantly sort of spinning plates and trying to get everybody down. And even different, people li like different types of games, right, yeah. on a team. So, it, you know, it's impossible to make a ga game that can appeal to everybody on the team. Some people like certain elements more than others or whatever. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I went to a, a conference last year, a Sony internal conference, where you talked, and you talked about that kind of the the challenge of keeping the faith, and I think you talked about them, Atreus. And can you talk a little bit about kind yeah. of... Um, the challenges with having the boy. Yeah. I mean, that was, I've talked about this a lot, but like, like that was not a popular decision in the beginning. It was sort of, hey, that's cool. Great, it's going to be a dad. Uh, but a lot of people uh, on the team were sort of the old guard. These are people who worked on God of War back in 2003 when I first started there. So we were making, you know, the original God of War. And to them, they were like, there's going to be this kid running around. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be having combat, and there's this kid running around. That's really annoying. And they're remembering, uh, not saying any specific games, but they're remembering games that had escort missions and, and companions that were not so good. And for me, even though I was aware of those games, I was like, all right, well, there is a really great example in uh, Last of Us yeah. where, you know, they actually pulled off something I think really amazing, and they did it in a way where, I mean, they threw out most of their work six months before ship. Because that's who they are. That's, that's, that's what they do. They realize this isn't working, and so it doesn't matter if the schedule is there. They said, hey, let's throw this out and let's start over. And it was actually simpler. So they were making something really complicated, which is what we do. Like when you start at the beginning, you're going to make something that's going to be the most amazing sort of PhD thesis in, in, in companion AI. And uh, in the end, it really needed to boil down to a few simple rules to prevent the player's experience from sucking, yeah. right? So for us, we sort of looked at that, added a few rules to the, the, the ones they had, and really kind of made it around this idea of, let's make it really simple, right? We didn't have it figured out right in the beginning, but we at least understood right from the beginning that it should be simple. We should have a single button, right? Only one button dedicated, and now that we have the new camera where we can look around, we can use the camera for intent and then the button for action. Yeah. So therefore, if I'm looking at a door, the action changes based on wherever I'm at. So it's contextual without actually putting icons or anything, so it allows you to get a bit more immersed in the world. But even then, that, I mean, Atreus did not intelligently come online until probably September, the year before we released. Wow. You know, okay. it was like so much went into this, and we kept just kicking the ball down the field. Uh, every time we were like, oh, this isn't working. Well, that's fine. We'll figure that out later. Uh, which that is a huge thing in development, where you realize when something is scary or very hard, you go, ah, that's fine. I'll, I'll figure that out later. Uh, and I realize that somebody has to figure that out at some point. So when the people who have to figure it out start telling me, that they're going to figure it out later. I'm like, oh, man, I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I'm the one usually telling you to do this, like they're telling me they're probably not going to get done. There was a point uh, where we were going to cut Atreus completely, and it was mostly just due to, to, to budget where we were realizing, I think, in the beginning, you look at the, the problem, and you say, oh, this is very complicated, and you pad it. And you pad it tremendously when it's a problem that you haven't done before. And nobody at the studio had done companions at all. So they ended up padding it so much that it was like 2030 was when the game was supposed to release with how much it was going to take to do this. Or I would have to cut a ton of, ton of stuff in the game. And I was like, I can't really do that. And finally, the, we realized, well, we're struggling to hire engineers. I don't think we're going to be able to do this. So I ended up writing up a, a pitch for a, a game without Atreus just as a backup. And thankfully, I never had to wow. use it because we ended up hiring a few programmers. I ended up convincing some people, hey, don't worry about this. This will be fine. We can figure it out. Uh, but it, it really is. It's a lot of begging uh, being a director and a lot of like uh, dealing with the fact that 50% of the time, 50% of the team is not supporting the idea that you're talking about. And then another 50% is not supporting a different idea. And you just multiply that by every single day. There's a different thing. And it's not because they're bad people or they're malicious or anything like that. It's more like they just don't see it and they are focused on this other thing. So they're like, oh, I don't know if I agree with that or if it's conflicting with something that they want to do. So it's a lot about relationships. Mm. So, I mean, God of War was incredibly well received. I mean, you guys have won so many awards. I mean, how, how have you kind of like processed that? I mean, you know, coming up to release, it was a you know, hard, hard finish, but... Um, you know, following that, you know, how, how does it feel? 
exhausting. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like it's interesting. I haven't. I don't know if I fully processed all of it yet. Uh, it's been a very wild year afterwards. Uh, it's one of those things where we had our heads down working so hard for so long, and and there was a point of time where, while we were happy with what we had done, I think a lot of us still had that possibility in our head that we're like, oh, this probably isn't going to be received very well. You start to lose perspective, yeah. right? You, yeah. you get too close to it. Right? Yeah, you don't have so. any sense, and because everything was so insular, and so we had to keep everything pretty secret, we only had ourselves to talk to, so... You know, there's, a, the, there's always these sort of champions on the team, people who are just incredibly positive all the time, no matter what, uh, and they're really good people to kind of feed in. But if you've heard them for five years, you start to not believe them either, so then you just get into this, like, negative cycle. So I think when, it, when the, the, the reviews came out, when people started talking about it, uh, you know, it was very exciting. But I think as it progresses on, maybe six months after release, then it's just a lot of pressure. Right. Then it's just like, oh my gosh, like what am I, uh, what am I doing here? It's like that uh, uh, story people are talking about with uh, Dave Chappelle, where he had done second season of the Chappelle Show, and it was absolutely hilarious. And I think he was feeling such a tremendous amount of pressure. It was like, how do you top that? Yeah, where did you go from about that? It? Yeah. So I guess I'm just going to play World of Warcraft for a year. Cool. I think that's probably yeah, what that's I'm doing. No bad thing. <laughs> um, so, I mean, um, God of War was a, a, a reimagining eh, was of the, the franchise, kind of um, a reinvention of the franchise. So what were the core elements you decide, you really wanted to keep, and what were the stuff that was more on the peripheral that was the, uh, less important from the previous games, I think? We had a lot of discussions in the beginning where we went into a, a conference room and just basically wrote every sort of load-bearing concept of the game on the wall. So literally every possible thing we could think of that represented the game from Greek mythology to the blaze of chaos to the double jump uh, to platforming, all this kind of stuff. And we kind of listed it out and we went through point by point and started talking about each one, trying to determine that if you remove this, does it make it not God of War? Uh, and, and even in early discussions, people were saying we had to get rid of Kratos. So there was a bunch of people who were in the camp of, you know, no more Kratos. He's, he's annoying. He's done. And I had already decided right from the beginning, I was like, I want to use him because I want to see if we can make a turnaround with the character. I want to see if we can take somebody that people hate, you know, or they like to hate. A or, little or, less angry. Yeah, and, and figure out if you can sort of take that backstory and change it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but there were several people who had said, you know, you really got to get rid of this. He's not, he's not God of War. You know, Greek mythology's God of War, which I was like, oh, really? And we had a, a, a long discussion back and forth about this where they're saying, yeah, 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 people associate Greek mythology more with God of War than they do Kratos. And I was like, well, that's a bummer because it means we can never go out of Greek mythology if we're really tied to that uh, as opposed to the character. And I think it was just they really did not like the character. They yeah. wanted to see him, they want to see a new character, and I think really what they wanted to see him change. Uh, and so that took. A lot of convincing to say, like, no, 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 I really think this is a good idea. We need to stick with this. But, you know, the jump, surprisingly, was not a hard thing to get rid of. Uh, I was a little nervous at first, but when I had basically waited against new camera system and the jump, the systems guys, Eric Williams is a guy I've worked with for a, over a decade and a half, probably, and he was the one that basically said, look, do you want to tackle the camera or do you want to tackle the jump? Because the jump is something you'll figure out after you figure out the camera. Yeah. And the camera's going to be really difficult. And now you don't want to cut the camera. So you should cut the jump. And I was like, all right, yeah, that seems fine. Uh, and then as we started progressing through, I would hear people uh, publicly talk about the new God of War and say, I, I can't believe they got rid of the jump. I'm really disappointed. Not my God of War. Hashtag not my God of War. For getting rid of the jump. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, really? That's the thing that really broke the... Uh, yeah, it's probably best to avoid Twitter during development. Right? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, and then, so, and you added Atreus, right? So I yeah. mean, that was quite a, a, a departure. I, I, and um, I think you've talked in the past about you know God of War being your most um, you know, personal to you experience, you know, with being yeah. a father or whatever. So, I mean, what did you bring to 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 the story with regards to kind of that? That was a, a thing I had learned. I've been working with a bunch of film directors. So after I left Sony in like 2007, kind of was doing a creative walkabout. We're just you know, meeting with a bunch of different people and trying to learn. I felt like I had learned a lot at Sony, but I was very infant in my sort of uh, abilities. And I needed to 
understand a lot more. And um, some of the people that I was talking to kind of were echoing something that Sam Mendes had said. And he had talked about finding your own way into a story, right? So that if somebody else writes your story, if you are a director who's basically taking a, a script off the shelf, if you're adapting a book, uh, if you're brought on a project a little bit late, regardless of what that is, find your personal way into the story. There is a connection to every story that is personal to you. And if it isn't, it's going gonna, it's gonna to read on the, uh, on the screen, right? If it doesn't mean something to you, if there isn't a connection, then it, you're, you're actually going to feel it. And you can make a lot of really cool things, but the thing that we sort of aspire to, I think, as, as creative people is to kind of connect to the audience, make them feel something. Uh, and I, that lesson took a while for me to get. I think it, it took a few years for me to really sink in so that when I came back to Sony and I realized, like, all right, well, the, the biggest thing that happened in my life is I was shipping uh, Tomb Raider 1 and uh, my son was born. Right. So... I was either going to make Tomb Raider 1 a, a, a ripoff uh, or uh, incorporate my son into the story. Uh, and, you know, I think for me, as I started thinking about it, I realized, like, oh, there's a lot that changes. You know, as everybody says this, you have a, a, a kid and your sort of life changes. But you sort of, your perspective changes on things. And it made me think about this idea that, okay, here's a character who everybody dislikes, who we built as an anti-hero. The whole goal was, you know, at a time... There were not a lot of anti-heroes uh, in games, so I think that's what we leaned into. But this idea of saying, all right, give him a reason to want to change, right? He's already got a reason. I mean, spoilers, but at the end of God of War 3, he doesn't get to die. So he's kind of tormented. He's cursed. He's a guy that's going to walk the earth forever. That he started the first game way back in 2005, jumping off a cliff and then not being able to succeed. Spoilers, again, sorry. Uh, <laughs> And he ends in God of War 3 not being able to kill himself with the most powerful weapon that's supposed to be a god killer. So clearly he is cursed to walk the earth forever. So giving him this motivation, this external motivation to change, was very interesting because I was aspiring for the same thing. So at the time I was like, yeah, I'm going to work a little bit less, right? I'm going to have a bit more focus on my, my home life and my, my work life. So he was kind of this reminder as I was working that we were both struggling with our own sort of lives. Yeah. And we were both motivated by a very similar thing. And I think that idea of bringing that personal aspect into the game meant that we could start pulling it from everybody in the, the, the studio. So a lot of people that I work with uh, had worked on the earlier God of War games, and we're all old now, uh, and we all have families. So we're all kind of in a similar place. We're all people who, when, when we were making the first God of War games, uh, we were in our college years, right? We were like, mm, screw you, we're going to top everything. We're better than everybody else. Uh, and now I think we're, we're, we're just more like, we want to make something that we're really proud of. Yeah. We want to make something that we want to tell our families about. Uh, and, and that gave us an opportunity. There's so many moments throughout the game that are from you know, interactions with various people on the team and their kids, uh, people on the team and their parents, uh, you know, just people on the team and their significant others. They, they, everybody has these sort of personal stories that as we're walking through the studio having a random conversation, I'm realizing, I'm going to steal that, I'm going to steal that. Okay, that's great, we're going to incorporate that in there. And I think being open to that is a huge aspect of this job, is just being able to say, this is very interesting, we should use this in some way. And I, I, am I right in thinking that the, the novelization is written by your father as yeah. well? So it's like a full-on kind full of... Full-on. It's like a family affair. Right? Yeah. Uh, it's like the Trump administration. Uh, but yeah, it, it basically, for me, was this idea that God of War II, my father and I broke that story first. So we were originally writing the script together, and the direction I was steering him in was a really bad direction. Uh, and we kept pushing towards this thing until... The story just was not working. It was collapsing under its own weight and realizing that this was just not there. And we were fighting, right, because it's family. And yeah. when you write a script with your dad, you're going to argue a lot. Uh, and Did he call you boy? Right. He, yeah. Boy, <laughs> we need to rewrite that would be this so script. Awesome. <laughs> that, like, boy came about because I didn't have the name. <laughs> like, like that, that was all, all because in the beginning of the, the thing, I'm very obsessive about names. Like, I can't put in fake names. A lot of writers are like, you know, Mr. White and uh, Mr. Pink and Mr. Brown, right? They'll just write in random names and move on. And, and I can't do that. I actually have to have the actual name. Otherwise, I don't want to put it in there because then I become distracted 
by the fact that it's not the right name, and I'll just obsess over that one detail. So I was like, all right, we'll just call him Boy. And, and then Chris really got into it, and he started throwing Boy. Uh, come yeah, Boy. does it really well, yeah, right? Yeah, like, amazing. literally every scene that we shot was ended with Come Boy. Uh, and to the point where we had to tell him, like, hey, don't say that anymore. Because I think we've got a lot of takes of that, and it feels like every time we leave, every scene ends with Come Boy. Uh, he must get that all the time, just walking down the street, people shouting that to him. Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure he has to say it like 10 times yeah. a day. Yeah. And so um, you um, directed the motion capture shoot on, on, on um, God of War. How many days did you guys do? How, how long? I mean, oh, it was wow. a big shoot, right? It was a big shoot, but we do shoots differently in games. I'm hoping that we can figure out a way to make shoots different. Uh, because I think shooting a, a, a nice chunk, doing like a, a 15 or 30 day shoot to get all of your, your, your sort of mocap work done is a really good way. We shot like one day at a time, spread out over like four years. So we do one day, two day, or a three day. And it's really hard because by the time you get like you do a three day shoot, by the third day you're really into it and you're ready to go and then you stop and then you don't see the actors for like six months. Uh, and it also makes it very hard to book everybody. So if you've got seven people, uh, trying to get all of them aligned on the same three days is a nightmare. Uh, that, is, that was a logistical nightmare, so I was hoping to figure out better ways to do that. But it's, for me, that's the closest way I can stay connected to everything. Um, we did the, the, the sort of audio and mocap separately in the early God of War games. Okay. So I would go into the, the VO booth and direct the actors there, and then we'd go and shoot with somebody else, like a stunt actor. Uh, and then we kind of assemble all of it, because most of it was done by hand animation in the game. Uh, and now, in order to get what we wanted from the scenes, to get the characters to actually connect, uh, we wanted to do everything on set, plus it was the, the no cut, which was way harder than I imagined on set. Like, I actually had to deal with it. It wasn't just this big idea that I was like, somebody go figure this out. It was like, no, we had to go on set and do these like seven minute single take shots with a nine year old, you know. Uh, so that it was like giving him three pieces of direction. He's just like, uh, okay. And that I'm here, do something different on minute three of this scene. It's very, it was very interesting. As of my favorite times are on the set, but it's also, I think, some of the more stressful times because you have to get everything. Whereas on, on the floor, when you're working with everybody, all right, cool, you try something, it doesn't work. All right, that's cool, we'll come back tomorrow, we'll, we'll mess with it again, we'll mess with it again. You can kind of tinker and, and sort of finesse things for days. Whereas on the set, you, just to get everybody in there and turn the lights on for the one day is a cost. So yeah. that if you screw up and you don't get everything that you need, you have to do all that over again and bring everybody back in. That's not good. Uh, I tried to not screw up as much as possible. Um. I mean, from a casting perspective, how did you approach casting? Uh, poorly, I think, mostly. <laughs> uh, I, I struggled with that. Um, I had specific people in mind that I wanted to work with, but in the beginning, we wanted to see if we could figure out how to do the mocap the old way. Right? We hadn't decided whether or not we were going to have a new actor for Kratos. So we were going to have TC, but we needed a bigger actor in the suit to perform. So we were looking into tests of how we could actually modify animation mocap data as well as bring in the audio. And those tests didn't work out. So then we said, all right, now we have to try to find a very large actor uh, that has the voice of Kratos. And that took two years. And I had almost lost faith. I mean, there was a when we found Chris Judge, uh, I was getting, you know, meeting requests from Shannon and Yumi on a daily basis to say like, all right, let's talk about this. If it doesn't work out, we're going to have to go back to this. We're going to have to scale these things down. We're going to have to cut back. Uh, and I was very anxious about that, you know, because we found the kids so easily. Atreus was found like on the, the second set of auditions, right? I think he was like the first kid that, that came in on the second set of auditions. Uh, so I thought, oh, this is great. This is going to be so easy. And then it was not easy after that. He thought he was auditioning for a movie as well, right? He didn't. Yeah, I think they all did. Right, okay. Like, like, like Danielle, uh, who played Freya, she thought she was auditioning for Game of Thrones, which I was like, cool, all right. Uh, and then she tried not to be disappointed when she realized it wasn't Game of Thrones. Uh, Chris was the same. He was like, this isn't a game. This isn't a game. No, this is, this is a movie, right? And I was like, should I tell him, or is he going to not want to do it? Like, how long can I hold the lie on to tell him it's a movie and then be like, by the way, Chris, this is a game and we just shipped it? Uh, 
But he was very, he was very happy about it. I think his son actually was a God of War fan, so he was able to get into that. Balder was a very hard character to cast. I did a lot of director letters uh, initially. Jeremy Davies, the guy who ended up playing Balder, was somebody who I thought about in the beginning because I just finished watching Justified, and I thought he was absolutely brilliant as Dickie Bennett. Uh, and so I thought, oh, we should get this guy. And, and then I'm like, he's not going to talk to us. I mean, because we had bad experiences with actors on the earlier games. Um, you know, we had, had contacted several actors that are fairly well known uh, that came back to us and said, you know, $10 million is what they want. And yeah, I was like, $10 million? Well. Yeah. I was like, our budget's not even $10 million. What are you talking about? We can't pay that. Uh, and it was just that they had a bad experience with the game, so they really didn't want to do it. But that was their way of saying no, was by asking for a lot of money. Yeah. And then other people just flat out said, like, I will never work on a video game. Uh, and then other people who I fought really hard for and then ended up not working out simply because you get really excited about bringing in somebody who you're familiar with their work, uh, only to know that uh, they have a little bit of baggage that comes with them, so it makes it very hard to kind of get what you want. I mean, your experience, like, you're bringing in actors that are fairly well-known as well. Yeah, I mean, we... I mean, I, I guess uh, we've historically, and I guess like a lot of people in the industry, you, you just hire VO artists, right? You, you have the right voice, you put them in a, a booth, and it's all, it's all fine. Yeah. And I think, you know, with, um, with Blood and Truth, we wanted to try and scan in the artists and, and, and try with photogrammetry. So we suddenly, um, we, we created a much higher bar from a casting perspective yeah. because we had to find someone that obviously had the right voice, um, but also looked the, the look for the part and also could physically act and I think you know particularly within within uh, VR and the, the motion capture that went there because the player is the camera it's much more of that ensemble feel it's almost like theater um, direction um, so trying to get that uh, that combination where again we'd kind of have some show reels coming in where they had great acting chops and they definitely sounded the part but they didn't look like the kind of character we wanted to put in the game. So trying to get those three combinations made it definitely more challenging. Yeah. It's, um, it's great, because I think VR is helping to usher in a little bit of the, a, a more comfort on the game side to actually look at actors to be in the game. Right? I think for a long time, uh, people were saying, oh, we don't need uh, to have the likeness of the actors in the game. We don't need celebrities, you know, bring in... Uh, you know, various voice actors, whatever. And I like to actually have a good balance uh, because there are certain performers you're like, look, this person is just perfect for this. I get it, they, they, they're a name, but like, they're going to be perfect for this. Yeah. And I think you, you end up battling a lot of sort, of sort of game understanding of like, oh, that's not necessary, right? But I mean, clearly, it is something that is becoming more accepted when you see something like uh, Johnny Silverhand with, with uh, Keanu Reeves playing in Cyberpunk. Yeah, that's cool. Right? Literally the entire cast of Death Stranding uh, is amazing. And I think, for me, that's, I think that's a really exciting aspect, is that we're starting to see more of a, a connection between these industries. Because there was pretty much a wall for a while. Like, I felt like yeah. in the beginning, there was not this connection between these two industries, and we're seeing a lot of younger directors on the film side come up that play games, yeah. that are more aware of this, a lot more actors who are fully aware of what this is, and we're actually able to give them meaty performances, as opposed to you know just doing voice, which I think uh, great voice actors are a treasure. When you find an incredible voice actor, it is absolutely amazing, but also being able to have somebody who can perform completely, take over that character, even in those ridiculous helmets and those unitards. Right? Yeah, That's, very skin tight. It's yeah. very difficult. I, I don't think I could do that. I think, I mean, we, we uh, similarly, we, um, you know, we, we kind of um, went into the Hollywood kind of route with our, our performance director, Rick Porras. So um, we knew really early on that we wanted to have a, a, a solid story for our game. And, and, and typically, I would say, as an industry, we're not great at stories. So we kind of partnered with someone who was uh, been a producer and director, worked on Lord of the Rings movies, uh, Contact, Forrest Gump, to come and kind of help yes. us with oh, yeah. character yeah. development and story development, which was super useful. And then when we actually came to do our performance shoot, we were like, w we need someone to direct this stuff. We, we didn't feel super comfortable you know, directing ourselves. Uh, so we had to try and find a director for our mocap shoot. And then we thought, 
Well, Rick knows the characters really well. He directed the second unit scenes in Lord of the Rings. He knows his stuff and brought him on board for that. But I think for him as well, it, you know, within VR, because you've got no close-ups, you've got no cutaways, it's, it's definitely challenging. So uh, yeah, it was great to kind of have him on board and really help kind of bring out the performances from our cast that I think we might not have got otherwise. I, I mean, you know, stories in, I mean, we were trying to ape an action movie. The whole thing is like being an action hero, um, you know, John Wick, James Bond, um, John McClane. And you know, I think it's, you don't need to have amazingly complex stories with an action movie but they've got to be solid and the, and the characters need to be solid and believable to just bring you into the world and immerse you. And that was super important. I think some of the best stories are simple, Yeah. right? For me, it's this, this adage of simple stories, complex characters, right? Your, your, your characters having layers and, and depth and dimension and feel like they're really having an interesting arc that they're going through in this. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a complicated story. It's like the story I kept pitching people in the beginning was... Greatest Atreus going to the mountain to spoilers to take the mom's ashes, uh, and I mean that's pretty much in the opening cut scene. Right? Yeah, so, right. Yeah. And, and 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 that actually wasn't even the first story that we did. Like the first story that we did, we spent like a, a year on it, and I was trying out something different, where I was going to say, you know what, I'm going to let the the writers kind of run with it. I have a high level idea of what I want, but I'm going to really give them a lot more control, and. I realized that I'm terrible at giving up control. Uh, and then that what it did was it made me farther and farther away from connecting with the story. And they were doing a great job. It had no judgment against whether or not the story they were coming up with was a good story. It was just, it happened to be better suited for a later story, right? Because we were sort of assuming the relationship between the two characters was already what it was. And we were focusing more on the really interesting elements of Greek mythology or Norse mythology. So it was one of those situations where it's very easy, I think, as, as creators to go, wow, there's all this cool backstory and this cool world building that we can do. And you sort of lose sight of the core of what you wanted to do. And I had to actually like take that, shelve that story, and sort of figure it out, get, get deep into it myself so that at least I could be connected to it and then start working with them again. Uh, it was definitely, for me, this last one was a huge learning experience to feel like, oh, you know what, I can let other people take care of all this stuff. And the reality is I needed to be involved. I they yeah. still were the ones doing it. I still just needed to be like on a day-to-day -day basis guiding involved. It, right? Yeah, because I think the connection between the play experience and the story experience is so intertwined. It's like a soup that you can't separate the elements out of it, they are all one thing together. So this idea of like somebody writing a story over here and somebody making the game over here, it's such an old way of thinking and that it all really needs to fit together in the sense that it's not just questioning every decision and saying, should this be interactive? It's really trying to find the ways that drive the character forward in a way that feels like it's cohesive with the interactive experience. I mean, for you guys, it's got like, one thing I was amazed about while playing this game is trying to understand how do you test for timing? Like for us, it's like we can understand the pacing between walking and combat and talking and uh, being in a menu. And we kind of understand these sort of limits where we know don't want to go over this much. You want to try to integrate some of these things to ensure that you're getting a good variety and a good pacing. But from a VR perspective, like how do you find people's sort of attention span for story and then interactive and then yeah. combat. So I think, I mean, so w one of the things that we've, I mean, so VR is super intense and, you know, VR is a really young medium, right? I mean, it's still, you know, compared to the 90 million PlayStation 4s, there's 4 million PlayStation VRs out there. So it's still, still really new. Um, one of the things that we found really early on was that, you know, a gunfight and a standard console game, which can be intense, if you put that in a headset, it can be crazy intense, and it, and it works really well for yeah. that. But we also found that kind of, it almost intensity fatigue can kind of creep in. Yeah. So uh, my example is like, if you're, play, if you're in a VR experience and you're escaping a building that's collapsing around you, and it's a 30 second long sequence, that is awesome, and it's super intense, and it, it's a really good payoff at the end when you escape. But you do that same thing for five minutes, 
about three minutes into it, your brain is just screaming to like get me out of here. This is just too much sensory overload. So we we had to um, we had to break our combat up. We, you know, combat is a key component of being an action hero. But we had to put drama scenes in there. We had to put object interaction type stuff and other kind of more peripheral type things, which were much lower intensity, but but actually also really work well in VR. I mean, you know, right. people just picking up objects and interacting. Uh, you know, we the knew from stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, the, we knew men. from um, PlayStation VR Worlds, the London Heist, which is kind of like the the spiritual um, uh, predecessor to Blood and Truth. That that stuff was really powerful. Um, but uh, but even actually within the development of Blood and Truth, we found problems there. You know, we 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 loved how in VR Worlds you had there was a scene in a pub where you had Mickey giving you a lighter and a phone and, and, and a cigar, and you could light oh, a cigar. Yeah. It was really cool. I remember that. Uh, and we kind of think of those objects as being toys. So when we were in development for Blood and Truth, we put toys everywhere. You could just reach yeah. into the environment and pick stuff up and play around. It was great. Uh, were people in playtests like, like doing unexpected things? Well, so this is what started to happen. So there's a, our third level in the game is a casino. There's a, a really light tutorial for a CCTV mini game. Yep. And we found that players had found some scrunched up balls of paper, and there was a basket in the corner, and they were getting the paper, and they were trying to throw it in the basket over and over again. And then by oh, the time... When you were at the, in the casino. Yeah, and then by the, time, <laughs> by the time the tutorial had finished, they'd paid zero attention. Yeah. Uh, so we, we and, and similarly, you know, we had these really intense um, drama sequences where people would just spend the entire time trying to juggle or just throw things all over the place. Yeah, I was throwing the papers so, back at yeah. the end. The first time the interrogation, I was like, so we, we had to we had to pair it back, but we couldn't we knew we couldn't delete it because there was an expectation and it was cool. But like we definitely like if we're ever teaching the player something, we just make sure there's nothing to distract you. You just like pay attention. And similarly, when we're in um, some of the drama scenes or whatever, we try and keep the props relevant to the scene. So at the opening of the game, there's a clipboard with Ryan Marks' photo on it, and you you can look at it or whatever. I'm not going to throw it, but you know you can kind of get that vibe of yeah. And, and and it's much more in keeping to the scene. But yeah, that's definitely something that kind of became emergent during development. I mean, actually, it was a question I wanted to ask you, is kind of what did emerge for you during development? Was there any kind of features that you didn't have planned really early on that kind of came out as you would, I mean, developed the game over five years? Wow. I think there's a lot, like, throughout development of every game, yeah, there's, there's always these sort of sparks, things that you're not expecting. Um, the size of the exploration spaces uh, definitely became... Because it kind of opens up, right, when you get bigger. the boat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and there was, a, there was always an intention, especially for the, the Lake of the Nine, to really not let you understand what type of game you were playing for a while. So much so that we didn't even show the press. So there was, there was an initial plan uh, to show the press, the Lake of the Nine, for the, the demo right before the game was going to release. And then I pulled back and said, you know what? I don't think we show them. Like it, it needs to be a surprise. It needs to be a surprise when they, they play it for the first time. And if we let them play it and then they show everybody stuff, everybody's going to expect it. And then they're going to be playing the game wondering when's that going to happen, when's that going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and that always annoyed me uh, about games when you, you feel like you know exactly what's coming up and you're like, well, when is that going to come out? That's why the Blades were such a big deal to try to keep a secret. Because I think if everybody thought they weren't in, in there, like they sort of had let it go from the beginning. And they just kind of embraced what was happening. And then when it pops up, it's a great surprise. Um, yeah, it was cool. It yeah. was totally cool. Yeah. But I mean, the throwing of the axe was the thing, I think, that was probably the most surprised. We didn't plan on that in the beginning. I wanted to have the axe in the hand. Uh, and we probably do a little bit of throwing, but it wasn't going to be the full on, like, uh, hunky Australian uh, throwing things. Um, but as we were getting the, the sort of core down, and I was not letting anybody on the combat team do any of the crazy stuff, I was like, look, I want to get it to feel like when you impact somebody, it actually feels like it sticks, right? As opposed to when you're doing fighting games, and this is the technique we use probably throughout all the other God of War games and all the fighting games I worked on. You basically do a, an attack where if you're going to punch somebody, you're basically following through, and then when the hitbox is detected, you continue doing the follow through. There's a little bit of a pause, and then they react. But there's not that real sense of like connection 
and then push through and then kind of change in the animation. And I was like, ah, oh, I think with an axe, we have a really good opportunity to do something that nobody's done before. And we invested like eight months, nine months into really prototyping that. And everybody in the comment team was getting so angry because they were like, we don't do all this cool stuff. You're not letting us do it. cool stuff. You're just, shackling us. Just prototyping the combat element because there was also puzzle elements. Just the elements core like, the, axe okay. of keeping it in yeah, his yeah. hand. And I was like, look, I know we can do all the crazy throwing and the, the magic stuff. I was like, can we get this? Let's try to nail this and then we'll move on to the next thing. And I think that frustration boiled over into a few of the guys who basically just said, screw it, I'm going to do this. And they ended up prototyping. Uh, George Mall and uh, Vincent Napoli basically prototyped the initial axe system, which was basically you could throw it anywhere, it would stick, you could recall it from anywhere. It was just 100% programmatic solution. And that was probably the coolest surprise of anything. Uh, and, and basically, I would spend every review, so we review like the levels and walk through the levels, and I'd just be throwing the axe, like, could I clear a tree? Was there collision on those rocks up ahead? Uh, I really annoyed people big time by throwing the axe constantly, and I think at one point they were like, we need to take this out because it's really getting on my nerves. Because I used to, when I was testing the games uh, on the earlier, like God of War 2 and God of War 1, uh, I would just sit there and jump everywhere. So I'd just be like going somewhere and jump, 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 jump. And it was like the combat guys were like, stop jumping. You are annoying me. And it was like the new jump was the axe throw. OK. So you found a new way to annoy your I teammates. Find, yeah, okay. I, I look for ways to annoy different groups on the team in different ways. I don't want everybody to be annoyed by the same thing, so I can really switch it up. But the emergent stuff is interesting, though, because uh, during development of Blood and Truth, like when we showed the game at Paris Games Week, which was our announce, we kind of had this kind of cinematic slow-mo happening at a couple of times. Um, and it was all completely scripted by, by us. And it was kind of when you, know, you jumped out of a window slow-mo to give you a chance to kind of see what was going on. And, and it also, if you shot red things, red barrels or red fire extinguishers yeah, yeah. blew up and you know, they slowed stuff down. Uh, and then we kind of, uh, we saw it, uh, people playing it at Paris Games Week. We saw that people were really loving that kind of cinematic slow-mo. So we started to then take that, take, go, went back to the office and started trying to iterate as to whether we can make it player controlled, which is on the two move buttons in the final game. And then it, again, once we had that in, it was kind of thinking, well, what else can we do with this system? So we. We started to like um, with some of the bigger enemies or some of the we um, vehicles in the game. You press down the, the the precision mode, as we call it, and to slow down the game world. And you kind of get targets to aim at a weak points. Those like weak points. Uh, yeah. And then you could even chain to extend the thing. And it was just yeah, it's kind of fun how you can kind of explore an idea space and kind of yeah pull that stuff That's out. Awesome thing about games, uh, I think, is very similar to, to television in the way that they're doing. You know, several episodes and then testing with the audience. They're actually getting the real audience. This isn't like a focus group. This is everybody watching it and going, yeah, I'm not liking this, I'm liking that. So they're able to react a little bit more. And we're able to do the same thing of getting people to play and then react. And I think the, the, the hardest thing to do in making video games is to know what to listen to and what not to listen to, like when you're playtesting. Like, that yeah. is one of probably the most difficult things that I've had to, to, to figure out over the years is you can go very wrong by listening to the wrong advice, right? And being able to discern between uh, subjective and objective, right? Uh, yeah. Of understanding somebody's not having a good experience. I need to improve the experience. Or somebody just played this game, and they want to shove this thing that they're really liking in this other game in our game, right? And figuring out how to not end up getting caught into that loop is very hard. I still get caught up into that. Like when we do playtests, like you'll hear something that just gets under your skin uh, because they're pretty brutal. When people playtest, they're very honest. Uh, and, and also, like you know, you're crafting a story, right? A story yeah. where you get to know characters, and then suddenly you drop people playtesting midway through the game, and you know they haven't got that emotional connection. Yeah. Or if it's like uh, uh, the writers and the animators doing the voices temporary, yep. and the animations are really bad, and then everyone's saying this story's terrible. Uh, and you're like, all right, well, are they reacting to the fact that it is presented terribly because they're seeing it in a very rudimentary form, or the sound and the voices were dropping in and out? Uh, one person could not get over the fact that Kratos was played by a different person like throughout the experience. So we were testing probably a four or five hour segment. Okay. 
And we just had a bunch of 10 voices. So it was like, you know, sometimes it was one of the animators, sometimes it was the writer. They think that was some sort of creative decision you yeah, were going they thought, for? Yeah, okay. they thought we were intentionally doing that. And I was <laughs> like, hmm, all right, no, we're not doing that. But it is very difficult to test something that's not done and fight that urge that says, just relax, it's not done. Like, instead of just listening and going, like, all right, I get it. They don't like that. I'm not really going to listen to that. But they don't like this, and that's really important. Fundamentally, they're not going to have fun if they don't do this, or they don't understand something. That's the other good thing is we we found a playtesting helped us a ton on finding areas that we took for granted. The 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 idea of of Freya, uh, uh, sort of, or sorry, the the Freya giving herself up to to Balder to say like, look, if you want to kill me, kill me, uh, and. We took it for granted because, you know, it was like a small group of people who were like, yeah, of course, for my kid, I would do that. Uh, but a lot of people who were playtesting were like 18, 19, and didn't really get it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's weird. So maybe this moment sucks. Maybe we failed. And then we playtested it again, and it got even worse. And people were really angry, like angry, capital letters in the, the feedback angry uh, of saying we ruined it, and she was a good character, and we screwed it all up. And I was like, what is happening? And I ended up talking to one of them and explained what Kratos ended up saying uh, in, in the game in a conversation and realized, like, oh, my gosh, we never explained it. That was our problem, is that we took it for granted. We assumed everyone would understand that she was basically, she would rather, like, lose her life and let her son live. And, and for, for people who have not been in that place in their lives, they just, they needed that explained. And when it was explained, they're like, oh, I totally get it. Okay, that makes sense. So we ended up actually having a great opportunity for Kratos to open up to Atreus, which we didn't have at that time, all because we needed to plug a hole that we had left open. Cool, cool. Uh, I watched the documentary, uh, actually, last week. Ah. Um, that, I mean, there was no, hold bar no holes barred, right? I mean, yeah. you guys pretty much were, showed it how it was. Uh, kind of... I mean, that would seem like a brave move almost. Like, what was the kind of the background behind that? And uh, what was it like being followed by a camera crew for it's weird. five years? <laughs> it's weird. Uh, like, well, and initially we had talked about, like, let's do, I wanted to shoot a bunch of footage when we first started. So back in 2013, I was like, let's just shoot something. We never know if we're going to use any of it, but I think it's cool. I love watching behind-the-scenes documentaries. I love to see... Uh, what it was like in the inception and when they were creating things, uh, you know, the, the making of the Dark Crystal. If anybody's ever seen the movie The Dark Crystal, there is an amazing, like, 60-minute documentary that shows Frank Oz and Jim Henson and all of them on these sets, like, using these puppets, and it's, like, mid-'70s. It's just brilliant. To me, it's almost better than the movie. It's such an incredible sort of slice of that creative life. Uh, and... I, initially, when we were talking about it, I was like, if we do this, we should just show the reality of it, which is something nobody's going to let us do. I was like, they're not going to let us do this because it's going to be crazy. Uh, but I was like, well, that's going to be the only interesting thing. I think if we just do a bunch of vignettes or behind the scenes, I don't know if it's worth it. And we had worked with uh, Brendan Aiken the, from the creative services at Sony, and he was like, man, I want to do this. I want to make a, a full feature length. I was like, yes, let's do this. Uh, because our job isn't hard enough trying to make a game. Let's make a feature length documentary at the On same time. On top of that, yeah. Uh, with a bunch of people who don't want cameras following around. So there was a lot of resistance of people on the team uh, that they didn't want cameras all over the place. And it took years, I think, to get people comfortable. And some people were just never that comfortable with it. But for me, I thought it was important because I think it was, it's an interesting thing to look back on. It's an interesting way for, I think, audience members to really understand what it takes to make a game. That as much as it seems like it's about playing games and having fun, uh, it's not, right? It's, it's, it's exhausting, it's stressful. Uh, uh, there's a lot of doubt and a lot of worry, yeah. right? And that's every project. Like, everything I've ever worked on is always this kind of, like, soup of doubt where you're just wondering, like, this isn't going to be good enough. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was surprised that we were able to put it out. I was surprised that we finished it. But I am surprised every day when we finish something, so I'm that, easily surprised. I, I totally get the doubt thing. I mean, I, mean I, I said earlier, kind of creating in VR is such a new medium. That doubt is even more accelerated. You kind of make decisions around how you approach your locomotion or your AI or, or certain other design decisions. And you kind of know that you, you feel like you're making the right decision, you're making it right for the experience you're making. 
but you have no idea whether people, when you release it, are going to feel the same way, right? You just the pool of expertise is a lot smaller, too. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. For, for making a, a game on a console, you bring people on, and they have experience. Even when you're trying something new, they're like, ah, oh, I have some experience in this. But from a VR perspective, everyone's still figuring it out, right? Well, and one of the things that we knew really early on was that uh, we, we definitely didn't want to make the game realistic because uh, that wouldn't have been great. But we wanted to. We, we came up with this realistic phrase. Feel? Yeah. Well, we, we came up with this phrase of reality through an action movie lens. Right. So the whole thing was like running out of ammo isn't fun, or having you know having a gun that runs out of bullets really quickly isn't fun. So we kind of really increased that because you know when you're watching a movie, you see like you know Die Hard, he's just shooting the gun forever, but it doesn't matter because it just works. Uh, and we we actually partnered with uh, we found we found a, an ex SAS soldier that came in and really helped us with kind of some of our dialogue bet certainly between the, the soldiers in the game. Um, he helped um, uh, our cast, particularly Amy Bailey, who plays Kayla, who's like a psychotic kind of um, a highly trained individualist. How she would carry herself in in a situation that. Um, Kevin, who was our SAS guy, would know not to try and mess with her. Um, and he also he showed our mocap director, uh, sorry, our mocap uh, lead, uh, uh, Gabor, seven different ways that he could disarm a, a gangster with a gun pointed at him. And it, it was pretty intense. Uh, so yeah, that was really cool to kind of bring that on board. But it, it was more about authenticity than, than realism. We didn't want to have realistic levels of you know gunplay or whatever. We wanted it to be a, a game. Fun, you know, fundamentally, it's it's a fun experience. It's a great right? aspect of case to ride. for all games. Is yeah, authenticity. You know, realism is great. It's not saying that realism is bad, but this idea that you can have realism and authenticity. But to have realism without authenticity, I think the authenticity is such a huge part of it, yeah. of getting that feeling of, of legitimacy, right? Uh, like we, we took a lot of the actors out on you know, some survival stuff. We taught people how to oh, use wow. swords uh, and, and studied sort of like medieval warfare and stuff like that just to kind of get a little bit of extra information, even if it wasn't exactly what they were using, right? It was this idea that they're getting a little slice of what it is like. Right, so that it isn't so crazy that we're all learning how to fully fight with swords or stabbing each other, but you know, being able to at least understand, even when it's not the same fighting style, it gives you a better sense of grounding within the world. I I think we're pretty much there. I haven't really got an ending to this. I don't know if you've got an ending to this. I have uh, a dance number. Okay. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Corey. Thank you. Yeah. Sir. Yeah.